We're at ISTAT 2015, and now speaking with John Slattery from Embraer. Thank you for seeing me. And if you could perhaps give our viewers a summary of your, your presentation today, which, of course, ISTAT does not allow us to record. Sure, Addison, and uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to have the chance to present uh, Embraer to you and your audience again. Um, I guess we, we had a, uh, a very good session today with an audience that uh, was nearly filled in the room. I think there's something like 1,800 uh, attendees here. I focused on, on three things today. Uh, the first thing was Embraer as an enterprise and the confidence that our investor community has in Embraer and where that, uh, where that confidence comes from, why it's, why it's justified. And then I spoke about the e-jets and particularly around our plans around the E2. And the third area that I focused on was what is the envelope of opportunity for Embraer over the course of the next 20 years? How big is the marketplace for the 70 to 130 seat? So if I break it down, I go back to uh, the first section of the presentation. I spoke a little bit about the fact that Embraer is a $6 billion plus a year revenue business. We've uh, $21 odd billion dollars in, our, um, in our order book, firm order book today across the group. And we got three businesses, all focused on aerospace, three primary businesses. So you have uh, defense and security, uh, which accounts for, between defense and security and corporate aviation, they account for about 50% of the revenues. And then the other 50% of the revenues uh, comes from commercial aviation. Certainly that was the experience in our numbers in 2014. And part of that, when I think about the 45 years that Embraer has been building aircraft, when you just look back over the last 10 years, we spoke a lot this morning about the number of aircraft uh, programs that Embraer has entered into service and has had successfully certified and then successfully sold on our corporate jet uh, business. Separately then we spoke about what we're doing on the defense and security and I showed a video, a great video of the KC-390 uh, which is our, our new uh, military tanker and, um, and transportation jet uh, which uh, we revealed in the fourth quarter last year. And just last month, um, she had her first flight, so that was very exciting. We got a great round of applause from the audience. Then I started to speak a little bit about the e-jets. So let me break the e-jet story out into two separate chapters. The first chapter, obviously, is the current generation of e-jets uh, and what we're doing in the marketplace. So today, uh, we have 68 customers, I believe it is, in 47 or 48 countries around the world. And that incumbency, that franchise footprint that we now have, will allow us to develop our operation and allow us to grow uh, in the coming years and coming decades. We have a stated objective at Embraer Commercial Aviation to get to 100 operators by the fourth quarter of 2017. That's of the current generation of aircraft. And there's very few commercial programs around the world that have achieved those sort of metrics and milestones. And of course, the magic of the fourth quarter in 2017 is that's just before the entry into service of the E2. But if I go back to the current backlog just on the E-Jets, we have roughly 1,500 aircraft sold firm. We have roughly 450 in our backlog. Uh, very, very uh, strong metrics that our investor community takes a lot of comfort out of. In fact, we delivered aircraft number 1,100 to Aeromexico earlier this year, uh, or early la late last year, excuse me, in the fourth quarter of last year, in December of last year. So we're on a hardwired trajectory uh, to reach the, uh, the targets of 100 operators uh, across the globe. One of the questions that uh, was introduced in the panel earlier on was how, how does Embraer finance their aircraft relative to our competitors? And this was something that I spent a little bit of time, and if I can, I'll share it with you now. We have a stated objective, and Marcelo Santiago, our global head of, of customer finance, would, would support this, of diversifying the finance base for the e-jets. So debt capital markets, WTC financing, asset-backed securitizations, mortgage debt financing, for, uh, financings from the banks, let's say, in Europe, or the Far East, or in China, or indeed the Middle East, and operating leasing financing. We like to have a nice spread across uh, the opportunities that we can present to our customers of how they finance their aircraft. When we think about the operating leasing community, we have to think, them, think about them in a, in a special way, of course, because when we think about the number of aircraft that they're going to finance going forward, 
whether it's through speculative orders or whether it's through sale and leasebacks, the experiences that Boeing and Airbus are having, and indeed we share the same experience, is that somewhere between 40 and 50% of aircraft coming off the line will be financed by operating less orders on a go-forward basis. We certainly have enjoyed speculative orders from some of the leading airlines, uh, excuse me, some of the leading lessors in the world. Uh, GCAS was uh, a lessor that helped us launch the program. Jetscape ordered very quickly thereafter. And then we had uh, Steve Hazzy and the Air Lease Corporation, ALC, order the aircraft. And then very quickly thereafter, CIT, Bank of China Aviation, and most recently, Aldis Aviation. So we have been an aircraft supplier that the operating leasing community is very confident in. When we launched the E2, we launched the 190 and the 195 with firm orders from what was then ILFC, which is now AirCap. So we continue with our relationship with the lessors, and subsequent to that, ICBC from China have made a speculative order. So just want to capture that in the context of ISAT, it's a financing uh, and trading environment here, and to capture the support that we're very grateful for. But not only those lessors, Addison, when we think about the lessors that will do sale and leasebacks, critically important to us. And today on the program, on the current generation, we have, I believe, 29 to 31 or 32 lessors that will very comfortably do sale and leasebacks on new aircraft that are del delivering, or indeed on aircraft that have already delivered, maybe three, four, five years old, and we'll be very happy to take those aircraft on board. So the second part of, of the uh, presentation was talking about the E2, where we are. And in summary, this is an aircraft program where we have an evolutionary program, if you like, but it's not just a re-engineering. New cockpit, new wings, new horizontal stabilizer, new APU, Primus Epic 2 cockpit to, co to complement the Primus Epic 1 we have on the, on the current generation. So uh, pilot commonality, if you like, in the cockpit uh, to great savings for the incumbent operator base as they transition into, uh, into the E2. So the E2 family, which will be made up of three members, the 190 uh, E2, which will enter into service in the first half of 2018, the 195 E2, which will enter into service the first half of 2019, and the 175, so the smallest member of the family comes at the end of that cadence early in 2020. So we're very excited about the new family. We've reduced the members of the family by, by one member from, from four to three. But we broadened the envelope of opportunity that those aircraft can address in the marketplace. We've extended, this is the 190E2, but we've extended the size of the 195E2 by three rows. So the economics around the 195E2 are going to be very complementary to the mindset of mainline airlines, LCC airlines that are chasing the economics. But as we think about these aircraft, and then when we think about the third part of the presentation, which was really what's the envelope of opportunity. These are aircraft that are focused on return on invested capital. This is, uh, whilst the cost per available seat mile is very attractive on the aircraft, certainly relative to our peers, these aircraft complement the larger 737s and the A320s. But when we look at the operations, when we take the Sabre numbers down, when we look at the operations of network carriers, and we look at the percentage of flights that are taking off every year that are below 110 seats, or that, excuse me, that have less than 110 passengers, but are being operated by aircraft that are 140, 160, 180 seat capacity aircraft, what that tells us is that the aircraft that are currently ser serving some of those markets, if I just look at North America, we're talking about 540 odd thousand flights a year that are being served by aircraft that are too big for the mission. And therefore, the idea of right sizing the asset type that's addressing those markets, bring down that trip cost. Those are mainline flights. Mainline flights. Uh, our flights in North America, whether it's mainline or regional, they're flights in North America from the, just the, those three uh, network carriers, American, Delta, and United. So if you can address a smaller gauge activity, uh, aircraft to, those, to that activity, you will bring down the trip cost significantly. You should, obviously, mathematically increase the, uh, the load factor. And then, of course, the most important part of this is not the load factor, it's not necessarily the trip cost, but it's the yield you can get from operating the right size aircraft to the mission and to the frequency that's on those routes. So we believe that that philosophy 
of looking at engaging return on invested capital is going to get more and more exaggerated by airlines as the management teams get more and more focused on that as a metric of, of return going forward. As we think about the size of the envelope for us, 6,250 units over the course of the next 20 years, we expect that's the number of aircraft that will be delivered between 70 and 130 seats. Our current market share of deliveries in the market between in that segment is 61%. So we anticipate as we continue to broaden the franchise footprint, we expect to continue to address that market and hopefully we'll win the confidence of our customers as we continue to listen to them and try and give them solutions to win at least 60% of that marketplace, maybe even more as we go forward over the course of the next 20 years. Question. The um, KC390, your company has obviously learned a lot about big airplanes now. What are you going to do with that knowledge? I think the ability of not only the knowledge from the KC390, but the tacit knowledge, if you want to call it that, from 45 years of developing programs and successfully introducing those programs and having them certified uh, is something that we enjoy right across uh, the business in Embraer, the three divisions. So for sure our engineers that um, have appreciated the even next level of, um, for example, the fourth generation uh, closed loop fly-by-wire that we've enjoyed on the KC390 that you're enjoying on the, um, the Legacy 500 and of course that we'll enjoy on the E-Jet. So unquestionably our engineering resources uh, around the world um, benefit from each of the new programs that, uh, that we develop and we enter into service. Last question, scope clause, is that a bother for you at all? Well, scope clause is, is part of our lives. Uh, it's been a driver for a significant amount of success for the, uh, for the 175 uh, in continental Europe and indeed for other members of the family uh, sorry, in continental US and for other members of the family in, in continental Europe. As we think about the scope clause uh, discussions, um, we'll have to wait and see how they play out in, uh, in 2016. I believe Delta is probably the first up. But I, the point I would make, Addison, is we have an aircraft uh, that's scope compliant today, that's definitely in demand. Uh, but we're confident by the entry into service in 2020 of the 175E2 that by that stage, whether it's both on a seat uh, basis and also on a weight basis, that scope will be in a place that will accommodate the 175E2 because the economics will be accretive to the airline uh, and therefore to the enterprise generally. I can't give you visibility on how long those conversations will take. Certainly they're starting next year. But we are confident that by 2020, when our aircraft delivers, we know that some of our competitors have aircraft delivering before then, but certainly for the 175, and that was one of the reasons we put the 175 at the end of that cadence of entry into service of the E2 family. Thank you. You're welcome.